what we do here is go back, 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 back. Hi, and welcome to Mr. Chayama's AP World History. We're now on to Chapter 12, Cross-Cultural Exchanges on the Silk Road. Here's our intro. The classical era witnessed the growth and consolidation of vast empires such as Rome, China, and Parthia. The relative political stability, economic prosperity, and close proximity of their borders encouraged an unprecedented growth in long-distance trade. Regular land and sea trading routes, collectively known as the Silk Roads, became established through thoroughfares for the spread of goods from the coast of China to Western Europe. This extensive trading network had several consequences, both intended and unintended. Number one, regions began to specialize in certain products that were particularly valuable as trade goods. Number two, merchants, traders, mariners, and bankers become much more wealthy and influential than they had ever been before. Number three, merchants, travelers, and missionaries carried popular religious beliefs to distant lands via the Silk Roads. Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Mithraism in particular become much more widespread. Disease pathogens were carried to populations that had no immunities to them, causing widespread epidemics throughout Eurasia. Inadvertently, these epidemics contributed to the downfall of the Han and Roman empires. Alright, so before we begin, I'd like to have you guys kind of draw these three little columns. Uh, they're not as are specific as I'd probably like them to be, but I think this is a good place because this is kind of a strange chapter. In the past, on the normal chapters, we were looking at uh, specific cultures, and we were looking at specific ways that those cultures grew and then probably fell or grew and continued on through the chapter. This one is a little bit different because it's looking at a idea or a structure, specifically the cross-cultural exchanges along those Silk Roads. And so I want you to kind of make sure that you know big three big things. Number one, that uh, there were certain places that had certain items associated with them. And even to this day, some of those places still uh, are known for those items. Number two, uh, there's a religious aspect to this cross-cultural exchange. And it wasn't just uh, goods that were being sold and traded along these routes. And so I want you to kind of keep an eye on some of the religions we've talked about in the past, but also some of the newer religions that we're going to kind of highlight and the changes of those religions. And finally, I want you to focus on the change in continuity of the Silk Road itself, as well as some of the cultures that interacted specifically with the Silk Road and how they either stayed the same or changed over time as a result of the rise of the Silk Road becoming a more integrated part of world history. So first up, we have long distance travel in the ancient world. Lack of police enforcement outside of established settlements. There wasn't very um, good structures to support traders within uh, the known ancient world. This long distance travel uh, was basically hindered by a number of different things. If you were a trader, you would have some problems because you wouldn't be able to always get your goods to where they need to go. Sometimes there were taxes and tolls along those routes, but oftentimes there were also robbers. There were uh, sometimes even wild animals that you might run into. And so since there's no police enforcement, sometimes people would rob, they would steal from one another. And this lack of police enforcement um, outside of where the established settlements were led to uh, people at this time starting to argue, we need to have a better system to be able to support this long distance trade because many empires and many different uh, communities believed that this long distance trade was valuable to them in an economic sense and that they needed to support this trading system in a more supportive way that didn't allow for negative things to happen along those roads. This changed in the classical period, number one, with the improvement of infrastructure. Infrastructure is just the improvement of the processes of uh, trade. So, for example, there were better roads. There were more established roads. There were more stops along the roads. There were sometimes uh, inns or some sort of like resting places for caravans to get water. And these were more marked out along those routes. Uh, imagine if you're a trader. We talked about this in the past. You might not know where you're going, but you know that there's a town maybe... 100 miles away from you that wants your goods and you want to trade with them. Well, if you don't have any roads to tell you which way to go or how to get there, you are going to have a very difficult time. You might run into some kind of sketch areas. You might cross over people's land that don't like you there. Uh, you might have some issues with robbers or, again, wild animals. So this improvement in infrastructure allows for long-distance travel to be a more supported uh, part of ancient times. And number two, there's a the development of empires. As empires rose, larger communities with more established bureaucracies and centralized governments, they had the 
desire to increase their wealth, but also to increase their knowledge of what was going on in the world, but also technology uh, from other cultures and spices and just pretty much anything that would go along with trade. These empires really valued this trade to increase their own personal wealth. So what they wanted to do was make sure that they had a very um, safe place for people to travel, but also uh, they were inf using the revenue from the growth of their empire to support this um, process that established, for example, police forces in outside of settlements. And then we have trade networks developing. There's a dramatic increase in the trade due to uh, Greek colonization. Yes, it goes back to Alexander again. Alexander of Macedon had gone all over the known world previously, and one of his big things was that he would establish colonies. Uh, there were a number of cities actually named Alexandria after him, the famous one being in Egypt. And as he traveled, he would establish um, posts where his soldiers could uh, get goods, they could get water, they could uh, rest their horses. Now, as Alexander's armies and influence shrunk, these uh, posts or these kind of like resting colonies uh, were basically converted over into small towns and eventually into maybe even larger towns for, in some instances. And those places became uh, a part of the larger trade routes that we talked about before uh, in the Silk Roads that helped facilitating trade. They also... Um, as a part of this Greek colonization, maintain roads, they maintain bridges. Again, uh, one of the cornerstones was not originally for trade, but it was for the transportation of troops. If you have a, a rebellion going on in one of your providences, what you need to do is you need to get there quickly. And the best way to move large armies quickly is along roads, especially established roads that the commanders and the generals won't get lost. And so you want to make sure that you have these roads and these bridges that many troops could move along. And as a byproduct of this, many traders were able to use those roads when the armies weren't using them. Uh, in India, there's a discovery of monsoon wind patterns we talked about um, in previous chapters where the traders along the sea started to discover that the monsoons were pretty predictable, and as a result, the, their sailing techniques could be uh, more uh, harnessed for the uh, benefit of trade. Finally, increased tariff revenues used to maintain open routes. Uh, a tariff is basically a tax for trading goods. It's a specific tax usually on a specific good. So for example, in America, we have trade tariffs with Japan and uh, certain cars that come into the United States from Japan uh, in an effort to kind of maintain our uh, balance of trade with Japan. We put tariffs on, like for example, cars like Honda and Toyota coming into the United States. They're usually small, but as a result of this uh, tariff system, they're able to make sure that there are certain parameters in place. In the car example, they use it for industry standards to make sure that people are safe and they use it to pay for people to like check airbags and stuff. In the trade networks that we're talking about, the increased tariffs were used to make sure that the routes were clean, they were clear, that if a, a storm happened and the road was washed out and the road disappeared or all the, the stones that were the road moved, uh, people would go out and fix them for maintenance. They also had um, small like police forces basically able to, ma to maintain the roads by keeping robbers away and, and just keeping a presence on those roads to make sure that um, nobody really got any ideas about robbing people. Next we have trade in the Hellenistic world. Uh, I want you to kind of put a star by this because this goes back to our first um, slide that talked about columns. Uh, we're going to talk about Bactria in India. They become known for having spices, specifically pepper, like the ground black pepper. Uh, cosmetics, gems, pearls. Uh, this just kind of becomes associated with India during this time. In Persia and Egypt, grain is a very large uh, commodity that comes out of that section of the globe, and it's very valuable to people because if you, your empire does not have lots of grain, you can go and get grain for your people, bring it back, feed them, keep down rebellions. In the Mediterranean, they become known for wine, oil, like specifically olive oil, jewelry, and art. And this all results in the development of a professional merchant class. We talked about labor specialization in the past. And at the time, there were people who maybe had jobs like farmers. And those farmers probably would just be really good at farming. But as uh, people started to grow more than they needed, they, they really focused more on their craft themselves, that specialization of labor. And then another group would come in during this time uh, the merchant class, the people whose only job was buying and selling goods and moving them along the Silk Road. Uh, by doing this, it freed up people who were craftsmen or agricultural workers to just focus on their specific good that they were creating, and they were able to get good, uh, fair, most of the time fair wages for their product and be able to take that product uh, 
only to a very short distance around their living spaces and be able to pass them on to a merchant class who would then move it to places where it was needed. Those traders would then raise the price and just like a store that we have today, when you go to Best Buy, you don't get to uh, you don't go to a Sony store necessarily to buy a Sony television. You go to Best Buy and they're a merchant who then will sell you the Sony TV and allows you to look at all the different goods that they have and you pay them a little more than you would maybe buying directly from Sony. But this facilitates uh, a better shopping experience and a better uh, good trading experience back in the day. The Silk Roads, name principal commodity from China. Silk was a very uh, highly prized commodity during this time, and it came primarily from China. It was dependent on imperial stability. So if the governments during this time were not very stable, they didn't really have a, a well-enforced uh, section of their trade route that they were looking at, and they weren't really going around and making sure that people were safe on those tra trade routes, uh, then most trade didn't happen as well. But if you have a very strong government that's able to take tariffs, take taxes, uh, set up tolls usually on those routes, uh, the stability increases and people are able to uh, trade goods. Uh, at one point, the overland trade routes from China reach all the way to the Roman Empire. And during this time, there's the development of sea lanes, which are set up sea routes for uh, maritime or oceanic trade during this time. Here's a picture of some of the land routes that were associated with the Silk Roads between 200 BCE and 300 CE. We've seen this before when we talked a little bit about India. Uh, but also you can see the new new uh, addition of the purple, which is the sea routes, which became pretty standardized uh, processes for trade over the ocean. Organization of long distance trade. Uh, it was divided into small segments and trade was done in stages. So the way trade worked is it wasn't usually one trader picking up the goods from example from China and taking it all the way to the Roman Empire. Many times merchants as a part of this professional class would take it from China and then travel for a certain distance and then reach a new um, point or a trading post and then they would then trade those goods to another merchant who maybe came from the other direction and then took that good and continued on the route. Uh, this leads to people being able to kind of know their markets really well. They're able to know their contacts of who to buy things from and who to sell them to, who will give them the best price. And this trading system done in stages keeps away wear and tear on traders. If you had to do a trading route where you went from China to Rome, uh, you wouldn't be doing that very quickly, especially back during this time. There wasn't uh, really any motorized or mechanical uh, ways of moving goods at this time, so you had to pretty much rely either on people power or animal power. And by doing this in stages, you save yourself a lot of time. It could take months to get very far away from your original uh, location, and so by having this process, you are able to save yourself time and increase your profits. Sea trade. Uh, basically, the people who kind of take over this section is Malay and Indian mariners, and also Persian, Egyptian, and Greek mariners during this time. Uh, many of these groups had uh, flirted with some uh, oceanic kind of interaction. Many of them used boats in their war types of uh, fighting, but they also became really skilled mariners of being able to load up goods very quickly. You harness the monsoon winds in the example of the Indians and be able to move those goods very quickly and very efficiently. So one thing I do want to hint on and really kind of hone in on is that uh, more than goods were traded through the trade routes. We oftentimes think of the Silk Roads as just being a part of uh, economics, that people just went, traded some grain for some silk, and then they got you know some money in between and that was good and fine but as these cultures started to interact with each other more ideas and religious uh, ideas specifically started to pop up in different areas of the globe that they've previously never been a part of up to that point so we get cultural trade we have buddhism and hinduism merchants originally carry religious ideas along the silk routes uh, india through central asia and eventually into east asia uh, these cosmopolitan or like worldly or what's another word uh kind of well-established uh, urban environments, urban cities, uh, promote the development of monasteries to shelter traveling merchants. If you were a uh, Buddhist, for example, during this time, you might travel along the Silk Route and as a merchant, but then you would want to have some place to rest and maybe some place to practice your faith. What you would do is you'd want to have these monasteries to kind of recharge your batteries, make sure you're practicing your religion uh, effectively. And so one of those things you would do is you would go out and make sure that people were getting uh, your culture and your religion shared 
uh, as you kind of built those monasteries. And one of the things that would happen is as it went farther and farther along the trade routes, people would eventually uh, receive word of like, hey, there's a new religion. Oh, what's it about? And people would maybe investigate it from the local area, and maybe some of them would convert. Buddhism becomes the dominant faith of the Silk Roads uh, around 200 BCE and 100 CE. It, it kind of has some positive characteristics for trading. The Buddha was a wandering monk, so it, the idea that you have to be in one place to practice your faith is not a big deal to Buddhists. Also, it's about um, being honest in your um, livelihood, right? Uh, action, right? Uh, vision, all those, the, the right way of living. One of them is right livelihood, meaning that you're honest, you're fair in all your dealings. And so as a result, people seem to trust the Buddhist uh, merchants during this time a little bit more. And between 200 BCE and 1000 CE, uh, they become a very uh, positive force on the Silk Road. Here's the spread of Buddhism, Hinduism, and Christianity between 200 BCE and 400 CE. You can see the green is Christianity spreading out from the Middle East, basically Jerusalem, where Jesus died. And then you get Buddhism coming out of India, where the Buddha was originally. And then you get Hinduism also coming out from that way. And you can see that uh, pretty much there's a kind of pattern happening. If you look at the orange, it pretty much hits a wall around Persia going west. But it eventually will make it to China, which modern day China still has a lot of Buddhists practicing within China. Uh, Hinduism pretty much only moved basically to the south east of Southeast Asia, but Christianity spread all the way until it hit about India and the Hindu Kush mountains in the east, and this kind of is why, to this day, Christianity is a very large part of Europe, whereas Hinduism and Buddhism is a very large part of Southeast Asia, India, and China. A Buddhism in China. Originally, Buddhism is restricted to the foreign merchant populations not because there was any restrictions by the government, but mostly because people weren't really aware of what was going on early on. And eventually, uh, people start to see that Buddhism maybe is appealing in some way, and they have a gradual spread to larger population around the 5th century CE. Buddhism and Hinduism in Southeast Asia. Sea lanes are in the Indian Ocean, the 1st century CE. There's clear Indian influence in Southeast Asia. The rulers are actually called Rajas, which is an Indian word for ruler. Uh, Sanskrit becomes used for the common uh, written language for communication. And uh, Sanskrit originally was the Hindu uh, language that was used for dissemination of Hindu teachings. And eventually Buddhism and Hinduism become popular faiths within Southeast Asia. Christianity becomes very popular in the Mediterranean Basin. We have a story of Gregory the Wonder Worker. Not much is known about him in a lot of the texts, but what's known about Gregory the Wonder Worker is he was very effective in his preaching and teaching style. He lived around central Anatolia in the 3rd century CE. He was known for his zeal or his like enthusiasm about Christianity. He would argue with people, debate people. At one point, he tried to be a lawyer and basically became a bishop instead, which is a, an overseer of his local church area. Christianity then spreads throughout the Middle East, North Africa, gets to Europe. There are sizable communities as far east as the borders of India. Judaism, Zoroastrianism is also practiced, but in a smaller scale in the Mediterranean basin. We get to Christianity in Southeast Asia. There's an influence of ascetic practices from India. As these religions traveled, they oftentimes ran into other cultures who had established ideas about religion. As those established ideas about religion became uh, disseminated throughout the community, many people decided to kind of create a blended version of their faith. If you think about maybe your religious background, some of you uh, have, for example, like Catholics have a religious background where they're supposed to pray and they're supposed to take the sacraments and they're supposed to do certain actions as to be a good Catholic. Uh, one of the things that happens as Christianity spreads out into other parts of the globe, it encounters uh, Indian traditions. And in Indian tradition, uh, there's a very f kind of established idea that a religious man or a religious person is supposed to be kind of like a hermit who lives by himself. They're not supposed to be very communal. They're not supposed to be very interactive with society because they're kind of looking at the other world. And so this kind of bleeds into the Christianity that's practiced in Southwest Asia. We get desert-dwelling hermits, we get monastic societies, groups that just live in the desert by themselves, doing their own thing, and people don't really interact with them in their daily lives, they just kind of are the monks that live in the desert. After the 5th century CE, uh, many followed Nestorius, 
uh, he was known as kind of a controversial figure in Western Christianity or European Christianity or what we would call today like uh, the Catholic and Protestant tra- traditions. Uh, he was anti-hypostatic union, which means he believed that Jesus had two natures to him, that Jesus was both man and both God. The Council of Nicaea basically said, no, that's not how it works. That's a very famous um, council that kind of laid out all the rules of uh, how Christianity should be practiced. And in the Council of Nicaea, they said that the hypostatic union is one of the cornerstones of Christianity, meaning that Jesus is 100% man and 100% God at the same time. And if he's God, he can do whatever he wants. So that's kind of the way they looked at it. Nestorius did emphasize the human nature of Jesus, which uh, if you think about how it interacts in Southwest Asia, the Buddha was seen as not really a holy man. He was seen as a just really enlightened person, a person who was normal, and then one day received the Dharma. And same thing with Hinduism, that it's not about people becoming gods, it's about people just kind of doing the right things and the right practices and really reaching a next level to their faith. And in Christianity, there is this belief that you're supposed to follow Jesus so that one day you can be as much like him as possible. So there's this kind of um, butting up against of these two cultures, not really figuring out how to interact with one another. And some of the practitioners start to do certain actions to practice it in their own way. We then get a new religion we're going to talk about. We get Manichaeanism. Mani is a devout Zoroastrian. He lived between 216 and 272 CE. He viewed himself as a prophet for all humanity. So like many religious leaders we've kind of looked at in the past. Uh, he was influenced by Christianity and Buddhism, which is kind of what we were just talking about. He was a dualist, which means he believed that everything kind of broke down into two parts. Uh, for example, he believed that the, for as much good as there was, there was also evil, and that good and evil were in this constant battle back and forth. The same goes with light and dark, that you can't just have light, you need to have dark to show off the light, you need to have dark to be overcome by the light. And he also really focused in on spirit versus matter, or the physical being. Uh, as humans, we kind of understand that there's like deeper dimensions to our world, there's deeper dimensions to the way we think about things, and uh, Manichaeanism kind of made this kind of two-part system that everyone kind of looked at in this area of the globe and said, mm, that's that's cool, that's interesting, I, I could see how you could see both ways. And so this influence of Christianity as being the good and needing to win, and the Buddhism as trying to find that balance between all things. The Manichaean society uh, believed in a couple cornerstones in their faith. They called the devout or the, the most uh, fervent of believers the elect or the elected, and this is going to kind of bleed a little bit into Christianity when we get to the Protestants um, in Europe and a little bit later. Uh, they believed in an ascetic lifestyle, again, living away from community, living away from society. Uh, they practiced celibacy, no sex. They practiced vegetarianism, which kind of goes back to that roots in Buddhism. They had a life of prayer and fasting, which kind of overlaps in both Christianity and Buddhism. Uh, the laity, or the common people, were known as the hearers. And they were supposed to be the material supporters of the elect. One of the things that um, the Manichaeans were really keen on is well, as you became the elect, you did less and less for yourself and you had the hearers uh, kind of provide for you and take care of you. So uh, as you became an elect and you de- devoted yourself, you kind of got like bonus points to not have to do work and people would just bring you food and you would teach them. That would be your labor. And so... Uh, the laity, if you want to be a Manich- uh, Manichaean, you would basically just provide, you know, comforts of life for those who are uh, teaching you about Manichaeanism. There is a decline, however. It spread throughout the Silk Roads in major cities in the Roman Empire. Now, with the Romans, they're still practicing forms of paganism at this time. Many of them you would call maybe atheists because they weren't really believing that the gods were up in the sky doing their thing, but they did kind of believe that, like, there wasn't just one God, and they also didn't believe that everything could be boiled down into just a simple duality, that there are many things going on, and the Romans didn't seem super concerned all the time with figuring out religion and what the gods were doing, but they were very anti everyone else's religion. Uh, Zoroastrian opposition provokes the Sassanid or Persian persecution. So in the Sassanid Empire, we have um, Zoroastrians basically persecuting the Manichaeans, saying that uh, this is not uh, very Persian. Religion isn't always um, a religious battle. Sometimes it's a cultural battle. It, it belongs to identity of people and how people see themselves being 
uh, for example, in a lot of Latin American countries, being Catholic is just part of being, you know, Panamanian or Argentinian. It's just part of who you are. So the Zoroastrians and the Sassanid Empire saw this new rise of this religion as being anti-Persian as well as being, in their minds, wrong. And so they had to persecute it. Manny is arrested. He dies in captivity. Uh, Romans, upon hearing about Manichaeanism, are fearing the Persian influence also persecute. Again, uh, religion is cultural as well as religious, and it's anti-pagan at its core. It doesn't really focus on uh, the gods doing their crazy things, like you know, making people push rocks up hills and stuff. What it is is it's more about uh, de-establishing the Roman identity. The gods, obviously, to the Romans were alive and well because the Romans, in their mind, were awesome. And so why would we trade our religion that's made us so awesome for this other religion that doesn't sound like it's very Roman? There's a spread of epidemic diseases. Uh, the role of trade routes in the spread of pathogens. Uh, think about our school. Normally, during the summer, you're pretty healthy, you're fit, you're sleeping, not that much. But then school starts. And you start to notice that people don't wash their hands as much as they probably should or use hand sanitizer. And people kind of are touching things all the time. And then you go from classroom to classroom and you're touching desks where other people were sneezing and coughing and putting their germy hands all over everything. And then maybe you pick up diseases. As people congregate and interact with one another, pathogens or germs are able to basically uh, spread. And we find that as a result of long distance trade, people brought larger amounts of germs, larger distances to make people sick. We have limited data on this, but trends in demographics are reasonably clear. A couple of reasons for limited data. Number one, they weren't writing everything down all the time because some of them were dying. Uh, sometimes we don't have as many data, as much data because people, as soon as an epidemic broke out in a certain section, they like ran away from those sections. So there wasn't like firsthand accounts of many of these things. And at this time, there wasn't a clear understanding of uh, how people got sick. And so what they did is they just thought the gods were mad or some god was mad. And so they needed to try different things. So it wasn't, they weren't writing down like, hey, people are coughing and now everyone's dying. They just thought, oh, everyone's dying. Somebody's mad. Uh, smallpox travels along that. They're little boils that go all over your body and they pop, they get infected, you die. Measles kind of like inflame your lymph nodes, make you really, really sick. The bubonic plague or the black death, which will affect Europe later on, start to happen during this time. And those, uh, ideas that they talked about where it was traveled by rats probably wasn't as true as you had been led to believe in your previous history classes. What it probably was was people traveling along these silk roads with their germs. Rats don't move very far within a community. Many rats don't move like miles and miles away from their original birthplace, whereas people in this example with the silk road can move far. The effect that all these epidemic diseases had was an economic slowdown. If you're sick, you're not trading. If you believe a city is very diseased or you believe that the gods are mad at that city, you probably won't trade with that city. And there's a move to regional self-sufficiency. People start to shut down their trade route sections. They start to say, we're not going to trade. They start to kind of look inward to their community to try and find the goods and services that they wanted before. And as a result, people just uh, not don't see the need to interact with one another on larger scales. Here is a chart <clears throat> comparing the Han and Roman Empire epidemics. Uh, the Chinese one happened uh, right around 400 CE, and there was a big one also in the Roman population around 400 CE, but you can see that uh, for about from around 0 CE to about 200 <clears throat> CE, there was a rise in Chinese population. People were doing fine. And then somewhere between 200 and 400 CE, people started to die off, and then it even drops a little bit lower to uh, below 45 million uh, people around uh, 600 CE. Uh, the Roman population, on the other hand, was at its peak around 0 uh, CE. You have 60 million people within the empire. You see some decline to 45 million, and then around 400 CE, there's a, a couple plagues that uh, basically wipe out large sections of the Roman Empire. The internal decay of the Han state. We're now going back to China to focus inward. There was court intrigue. Uh, according to our books, there were faction within the ranks of the ruling elites. People were getting marriage alliances and backstabbing one another and murdering one another in, in a bid to try and put their kids or themselves into power. 
there was a problem of land distribution. We talked about that in the previous chapters. Uh, large landholders developed private armies. Uh, this is similar to what happened in Rome. As land distribution problems happened, especially in the Roman Empire, private uh, generals basically raised armies to follow them. And uh, these epidemics lead to peasant rebellions because people are dying off and they see that the general mood of the culture and the community and the the government is so bad they can't even stop people from dying and maybe the gods are mad or maybe even if they knew that it wasn't the gods doing this they thought that something's wrong here and we need to fix this. There were peasant rebellions like in 184 CE, the Yellow Turban Uprising, which I talked about back in chapter 8, so if you want to go review that to make sure you kind of know what's going on there. The collapse of the Han Dynasty. Generals assume authority under uh, the Han Dynasty and reduce the emperor to a puppet figure. He's not really any power, more powerful anymore. Uh, there's an alliance with landowners. Those generals basically say, hey, we have the big army. You keep doing your trading thing. Don't raise an army to fight us, and we'll be in charge, and you, we'll, we'll make this thing work. Around 200 CE, the Han Dynasty is abolished and replaced by three kingdoms. We have the Wei, the Wu, and the Shu uh, kingdoms and immigration of northern nomads increases. So in the north of China, there are these nomadic peoples running around, and they start to immigrate or move towards these three kingdoms as the um, imperial structures that were there before under the Han uh, basically fall apart. And so as this happens, we get to what is known as the Sinization. Sin, uh, the Sinos or Sinos are Chinese. It just means China, Chineseification of nomadic peoples. Uh, social and cultural changes to a Chinese way of life. Uh, as those nomads integrated with the societies of, of China, they started to basically adopt Chinese culture. Uh, they adapted to the Chinese environment. Number one, they stopped being nomads and they became uh, agricultural workers. They adopted Chinese names. They adopted Chinese types of dress. They intermarried with the Chinese. And so these nomads are starting to now be a part of China overall in those three kingdoms. There's a popularity of Buddhism and Taoism. Disintegration of political order cast doubt on Confucian doctrines. We talked about in the past how Confucianism, legalism, all those ideas that were central to China during its rise to um, an empire uh, had kind of established within people this idea that they need to kind of honor the society. They need to honor the old ways. They need to kind of find their place in society as dictated by those ideas. But as the Han falls... Uh, the Han Dynasty falls, people start to ask questions like, why should we continue to follow the old ways if the old ways are what led to basically the country falling apart or the, the empire falling apart? So Buddhism and Taoism gain popularity. Buddhism, because it's not so focused again on the world, it's focused on the afterlife, and maybe maybe the government is kind of what it is, but you can't really fix that, so you should focus basically on the next life. And Taoism kind of has a similar like dualistic kind of thing to Manichaeanism, the, the light and the dark kind of stuff. And it's not, again, focused on this life. It's focused on the spiritual world. And these religions of salvation give people hope. In a world where everything seems chaotic, in a world where people don't really seem to have values to be able to place themselves in, many times religions of salvation provide people hope because they're able to say, hey, maybe you're not getting the fair shake in the government, maybe you're not having a good life, but don't worry, there's another life to come and you need to look at it as a positive thing. So yeah, you suffer now, but then there's an eternity of being happy because if you do the right actions, like in Buddhism, you'll live, you know, a pretty happy life when you die. There's the fall of the Roman Empire. There are internal factors. I talked about in the past that the uh, Roman Empire probably didn't fall exactly. It probably just shifted in the way that it uh, moved around and who was in charge. We have under the Western Roman Empire, we have the Barracks Empire emperors. We don't have Western and Eastern Rome yet, but we're talking about the Barracks emperors when it was still one large uh, empire. Between 235 and 284 CE, 26 emperors claim the throne, and all but one are killed basically violently in power struggles. One probably died of some sort of disease or natural causes. We get epidemics. A uh, book I read in college that I thought was pretty good was uh, Rodney Stark, The Rise of Christianity. He talks about how the plague of Cyprian in 251 led to uh, a new kind of shift in the way that people interacted with the government. With this plague, people started to abandon cities, and with this abandonment of cities, uh, there's a dis disintegration of imperial economy in favor of local and regional self-sufficient economies. Because people weren't inhabiting the cities, because these epidemics were happening, and basically there was just violence all around and, and not knowing who's really in charge, 
you start to see people say, eh, we don't really want to listen to Rome anymore. We're just going to do our own thing and they can figure it out by themselves. This leads us to one of those big truths I talked about in the past of world history, that a centralized bureaucracy is favored in times where the bureaucracy or government is strong and abandoned in favor of local control in times of upheaval or weak governmental administration. All this basically boils down to is when the government is working for you, people are pretty happy with the government. When the government is not working for you and not making your life better, people are more willing to look inward towards their local community or smaller regional communities to be able to provide the goods and services they need and to take care of themselves. We then get to Diocletian, who's shown here. He divided the empire into two administrative districts. His idea was this, that Rome had become too big and too unruly for one person to govern. And he had a couple, you know, people who were basically threatening to stab him to death. So what he decided to do was create what's called co-emperors with dual lieutenants. He called them tetrarchs. And he broke up the empire into four quadrants, basically. Uh, he also instituted currency and budget reform to stabilize the economy. He also made it so that Rome wasn't spending tons of money anymore to provide for its far-flung empire, uh, and it had relative stability that disappears after Diocletian's death and the civil war that follows. And we get a guy known as Constantine, one of my favorite people in world history. He emerges victorious. So there's our um, districts as uh, seen by uh, this time during world history. You can see that we have the district of Diocletian as Augustus, and there were basically two Augustus and two Caesars rolling as co-councils over their sections, and everyone kind of was just in charge of their region being uh, important to them. We then get the fall of the Roman Empire with external factors. Uh, the Visigoths who were influenced by Roman law and Christianity. They were from basically like Central Europe and um, southern southern europe they basically moved into the roman empire and originally were buffer states for the roman empire the visigoths were allowed to live because they basically paid tribute to rome they kept the people who were on the other side like the goths away from the roman empire and its heart of rome and this created like a border between the really really bad guys and just some kind of bad dudes and uh, the Romans were eventually attacked by Huns in, under Attila in the 5th century CE which dealt a massive blow to um, Roman morale and also Roman prestige and money. Uh, there was also a massive migration of Germanic peoples into the Roman Empire. As the empire became less and less Roman, people stopped seeing an identity with uh, preserving Rome as an idea. People didn't see themselves as Roman, they saw themselves as Germanic peoples living in Rome. And they identified under different banners of, nas not nationalism, but uh, different banners of identity. Uh, and then eventually Rome is sacked in 410 CE and established as the Germanic emperor uh, in 476 CE. Here's the Germanic invasions and the fall of the Western uh, Roman Empire. We have the Huns moving in from the east, the Visigoths from the north. We have the Franks from like the French area, Ostrogoths, Vandals, Lombards, Angles, and Saxons. All these people are going all over and just tearing stuff up. And it's becoming a big problem for Rome to try and keep itself together. There's a cultural change in the Roman Empire. There's a growth of Christianity. Uh, Basically, Constantine, shown here, uh, around 312, has this moment in his life where he's fighting a war against some of the other emperors of the Roman Empire. And he's trying to basically establish for himself the old way of having one Caesar. One day, he um, basically is having a battle on this bridge, and he has a vision where he sees this symbol called the Cairo, which is the first two letters of Christos, which means Christ. And it says um, to him in this vision, by this sign you will conquer, or by this sign you will succeed or, or win. And so he instructs all of his soldiers to paint this symbol on their shields and on everything that they have. And then they go and fight a battle at this bridge in um, uh, Rome, right? And so they have this big battle, and uh, Constantine wins and basically declares that as the new ruler, he's going to practice Christianity, and he promulgates or supports the Edict of Milan. And so the cool thing to do if you're Roman is to now just be like the emperor, and since he practices Christianity, you're going to practice Christianity. In 380 CE, uh, Emperor Theodosius proclaims Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. 
Then we get to St. Augustine, a famous Christian. He lived around 354 to 430 CE. He was from Hippo, which is in North Africa. He experimented with Greek thought, Manichaeanism, which will become very evident in a little bit. He was a, a scholar and a thinker. He was known in his early life to be kind of crazy. And then by crazy, I mean he just got drunk all the time. He slept around with girls. And early on, he kind of uh, had this moment where he had this weird feeling about Manichaeanism as being kind of crap because he thought that why is it that if I'm a laity or a common person and I have to help the elect why is it that I have to do all the work if they're supposed to be the like special ones and helping people out isn't it their job to like do all the work and help me to understand the truth of the universe or the world and so one day he's depressed by this and he uh, reads some scriptures from what would be eventually known as the bible from his mother and he converts to Christianity in 387 CE from then on, he becomes a major theologian or writer of Christian thought, and uh, he basically kind of codifies or establishes basic foundations of what we would call today Western Christianity, or the Christianity that you probably are most um, aware of being an American or living in America today in the 21st century. Uh, the institutional church is established. There's conflicts over doctrine and practice in the early church. They worry about uh, some of the things that Jesus did, Jesus said, and how should the people who follow Jesus act. Uh, for example, one of the things they were talking about was, should all Christians be like Jesus and not marry? Should, for example, um, Christians go and get jobs that maybe aren't really Christian jobs, but they don't want to die because maybe they're living in an area of the world where Christianity isn't supported? Or maybe should they eat food if all the food is sacrificed to the gods that are not real gods, according to Christians, should they even eat those um, food? Many of them uh, conflicted over the divinity of Jesus. How is Jesus God, but then he dies on a cross and then he comes back, but if he's God, he can't die, but you see how this kind of gets complicated. They also debate about the role of women. Uh, Paul, who we talked about in a previous uh, section, uh, wrote in 1 Corinthians 4, chapter 14, 33-35, said that, As in all churches of the holy ones, women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not allowed to speak, but should be supported, even as the law says. But if they want to learn anything, they should ask their husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in the church. So if Paul is saying that women shouldn't really have any role in the church, but from all evidence we have with um, history is that women were very influential and valuable to the church as a whole in these early days, how should women interact with the church? Well, as a result of the institutional church, church hierarchy is established, and people basically decide uh, that women are not allowed to be priests, that women are going to follow this uh, proclamation in 1 Corinthians, and we're going to get what's called uh, basically the establishment of the church fathers and the patriarchs, the people who were either around when Jesus was around, and so they wrote some stuff, or people who knew people who were around when Jesus was around and wrote their stuff down. And then we have a couple different people known as the church fathers who were like Augustine, for example, and a couple other people that were really close to some of the original followers of Jesus. And they all just agree as the institutional church that people who practice Christianity should value uh, first those people's writings and then also pay their respects to one specific bishop, the bishop in Rome. We know him today as the Pope, but um, he basically is seen as like the authority or God's kind of representative on earth. So we made it. That was pretty quick. When you have finished studying this chapter, you should be able to do the following. Discuss and identify the trade networks of the Hellenistic era and understand the development of the Silk Roads network. Number two, identify and discuss key commodities traded through the network. I told you. Number three, understand the role of the Silk Roads in spreading religions and e epidemic diseases across your Asia. Again, Europe, Asia is one giant continent, so we call it Eurasia. Uh, four, explain the circumstances behind the internal decay of the Han state. Five, identify features of cultural change in post-Han China. Six, identify features of internal decay in the Roman Empire. Seven, understand the role of Germanic migrations in Western Roman imperial decline. Eight, discuss the cultural changes of the late Roman Empire. Here's your writing assignment, five days sentences. Number one, in what ways did the network of trade routes called the Silk Roads make life during the classical era significantly different from the life in pre-classical world? Consider all the different effects and the various cultures involved. I would draw like some 
charts maybe i'm thinking probably some circle charts some venn diagram stuff how did china get affected how did india get affected southeast asia as a whole rome how did a lot of these communities get affected uh compared to pre-classical world versus the classical era which we just talked about uh, the textbook states, number two, the textbook states that Christianity was perhaps the most prominent survivor of the Western Roman Empire. What does this statement mean? How did Christianity manage to survive and thrive after the class of the empire? Christianity is still around today. It's 2016. So as a result of that, how is so much of what happened in Rome and Roman life not a part of our lives today, yet it's still a thriving thing almost 2,000 years later? Number three, how do the nomadic peoples of Eurasia impede or stop and or contribute to the development of the Silk Roads? What were some of their structures that they created to help support the, the Silk Road network? And what did they do to also stop that Silk Road network from uh, being a part of their everyday lives? As always, it's been great talking to you. I hope this has been helpful. Time to reread your chapter. Uh, I'll see you guys soon. Bye. What we do here is go back, 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 back.